at people as soon as I see the buttons. Yeah, I'll take care of it now so you can banter. Banter, or I'll start talking. Yeah. So here I'll do a little introduction. All right. Hello, and welcome to another of my series of conversations. My name is John Cornicello, and I go live every week here. Um, check the schedule at cornicello.com slash conversations uh, for dates and times. Coming up the rest of this month, they've got Larray Lobdell, Steve Brazel, Pratik Naik, Harold Davis, and Roman Lawrence. Actually, that it goes into a little bit into January. Um, before we start today's conversation with David Julian, I want to like the members to put your name and website or social media into the chat window if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Um, and let's also say your name when you start to speak so we know who you are. But without further ado, please welcome David Julian. Thank you very much, John. Thanks for inviting me to your wonderful new podcast, videocast. What are you calling it? Yeah, I don't this? know what I call it. It's Fireside Chat. Conversations. I really love it. It's a great platform. Conversations. And um, who better to start it than you? Because you know everybody and everybody knows you and you're a wonderful, <laughs> awesome guy. I'm oh. glad to, I'm glad to live near you enough to see you from time to time in Seattle. Um, yes. Yeah, so today there's so much to talk about and I'm glad yeah, to see I think faces we start, here. You're talking about creativity um, with this year of the pandemic. I mean, how has that affected you? Uh, how do you stay creative? And then we'll take it from there. That's a good question. Um, partly, I think it's just self-generated need to do something with what we have. Um, one of the things, one of the gifts that the pandemic gave me was that I needed to get, I, you know, my gym is closed. I depend on it to kind of let loose and relax is when I'm not on paddling on the sound. But um, taking morning walks has been incredible. I've never been a person who got out and did that, um, kind of a late riser, late, late to bed guy. But it's been wonderful to get out every day and be inspired by the humor and community that I have here that I've never seen quite as vibrant as now. And uh, I think that's one of the benefits of uh, using my camera or my phone even sometimes just taking photographs just as I walk of the small little things that people are doing to bring community together. Mm -hmm. The things that kids are putting together in their yards, just the, the oddities, the humor. I saw a whole, fl someone filled their yard with a whole flock of pink flamingos, all of them wearing masks. I mean, you know, why would anyone do anything even remotely as humorous as that before the <laughs> pandemic? So that's been the, that's been part of it. But um, I still did uh, an in-person workshop uh, right when the pandemic was was kind of on the upswing in June. And it worked really, really well because uh, we were in the Palouse, which is eastern Washington, bordering Idaho. And it was just wonderful to go there. We had lots of space to be socially distant and we uh, we had lodging. So I've been doing um, online workshops, um, in person, two workshops, uh, socially distant, of course, limited, limited group, and working on personal projects. And here's another thing, a lot of processing. I am finally catching up on processing that I have let go for years. And uh, that's been, that's been awesome. And uh, yeah, what kind of processing? Um, photo processing. Uh, yeah, I'm not using any uh, chemicals anymore, so it's all been digital. Um, I'm using mostly Lightroom, Photoshop, and sometimes Capture One. And of course, the Nick products. I really love their their plugins. So, yeah, it's also been a great time to work with uh, students one on one. So I've been doing some mentoring um, with individuals. Uh, that's that's really on the upswing, and I really really enjoy it. It's a great thing to be able to work with one person on their vision, um, give them feedback, give assignments and see them grow. Um, and that's something I've always done a little bit of, but I get to do a lot more of it now that we're, we're here. And also to keep people from feeling stagnant, like they can't go out and shoot. It's just not what you did before, it's something new. So we have to kind of reinvent ourselves and uh, tunnel deeper into the things that we care about. Um, I'm curious, your, what's, what's that, Michael? Your, who is your mentor? Who, who do you go to when you, when you need uh, mentoring? That is a really good question. And it's a hard one to answer because I did something very strange. I went through my life without any mentors, any direct one-on-one -on -one mentors. Um, I, I, was sort of, I was forbidden to be an artist when I grew up. And so I think it tunneled me into being very self-contained and almost underground in a way, because some of my work was very controversial at the beginning. 
And so um, I did know some photographers in New York City, and I did work with several of them during the, my days at the ad agencies. But um, I went to no one for one-on-one -on -one inspiration and support. And that's what the truth. What agency did you work for? I worked for several agencies on Madison Avenue. Did you ever see Mad Men? Yeah. That was my world. <laughs> I, I lived it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I, I, worked at, um, I worked at some general agencies, um, J. Walter Thompson, Daniel and Charles, YNR, a bunch of those. And then I went to uh, medical advertising for a while as a designer and also kind of as an early Photoshop guru. So, um, you know, we worked with very slow computers on very big files and watched a lot of progress bars. <laughs> but uh, right. I cut my teeth. I cut my teeth on Madison Avenue and then realized I did not want to be an advertising art director. So. Around what years was that? Um, that was while I was in college at Pratt. So that was 78. Uh, let's see. I got there in 77, 78 and 79. Okay. And then 80, I, in 1980, I graduated in 79 and immediately was working at the ad agencies uh, freelancing. And then um, I started working at Warner Brothers Music. So for three years, I worked at Warner Brothers Music as an art director. And the reason was, is because photography for me was a personal thing. It was something I did because I loved, I loved the device of a camera. And so I had a small collection of old and one current camera that worked most of the time. <laughs> and um, I love being out in the world alone. I didn't photograph people, I'm very shy, and didn't feel like putting myself in front of people with a camera for whatever reason. Um, and then I really love typography design. And, and so for me, I wanted everything in one package. So art direction became a way that I could come up with ideas for clients or for my employers at the time and then hire the talent necessary to put those ideas together. And, uh, and just to continue that, after Warner Brothers Music, I went to HBO, which was a Time Warner company, so it was an easy segue uphill. And um, I got tired of hiring photographers whose work was great, but I felt like I could do some of this. You know, this is fun. Why should they <laughs> get all the fun? So. Uh, that's when I started shooting a little bit more seriously and um, working actually with the Rainforest Alliance in New York to try to help them get a foothold in the world of fundraising for uh, deforestation conservation. And somehow I fell in with them and they said, can you be on our board? And as you're a photographer and designer, could you make photographs that are examples of deforestation and species loss? And can you give us a website? Well, websites were super primitive at the time. It was like Prodigy and AOL. There was nothing really that was a real website, but they'd heard the word or they'd heard something like it. I think they said, can you give us a presence? How'd they say it? This was earlier than that. They said, can you give us a, a wide global presence? Oh, that's an easy thing to do. Let's see, I'll do that on my lunch hour, you know, no problem. <laughs> But we came up with, uh, I came up with a logo, a brochure, and a look, and then started to populate it with illustrations and photography. And that's when everything coalesced. Mm -hmm. um, and it became wonderful. I got a chance to travel um, unpaid uh, on my own dime uh, to several tropical loca uh, locations to photograph um, with my little Nikons dangling by my side. I used to call them my rib breakers because as I hiked, they'd They'd bang into me, <laughs> and it was uh, it was an amazing journey. And, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I see a, a large format camera sitting behind you. Did you work in large format back then, or I worked in? Um, well, I didn't work in large format that much, but I did. Uh, I bought a um, I bought a five by seven at an auction one time, mm -hmm. and I put some sheets of film in it, and I loved the way it the way it looked. I loved the medium of hand of, of holding the, uh, the negative carriers and working in the dark room with that format. Um, luckily I had access to some really, um, large and largers in New York city at Pratt. And, um, that camera used to be the security camera at Ballard photo <laughs> on market street. It was yeah, a I joke. Them. Do you remember the them? It, camera? Well, I walked in there one day, they were, they were closing the store and they had this massive sale of everything in the store. It was like, it was like a kid at Christmas. 
there were lots of people in there in the back room. And I saw this thing and it had a little sign on it that said smile. And I said, hmm. how much do you want for your security camera? And they said, I don't know, give us an offer. So I just bought it. And I just love it. I love the device. I love, I love vintage um, technology and collect a lot of it. Yeah, I mean, but, you're quite a collector of objects. I don't know yeah. if you want to start sharing some photos or oh my God. Some, of your, some of your things. I know you do a lot of composite work. Uh, yeah, I can do that. I can do that for sure. Um, so our one, topic is creativity. So let's go into there and how, that, how you start a project and what you think of, think of and go through. Thanks for shutting me up so I could get into the subject at hand. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, um, I just put my website URL in the chat for anyone who wants to go there on their own. Um, but what I'll do is I'll just drill down now. I'm going to share my desktop. And let me know if you don't yep, see my website. Is. I see your about page. Okay, good. Is it just this um, web page? No, I see, see the, the webcam on the outside too. There. Huh, okay. That should have done a little bit differently than that. I'll just bring this up to full size. How's that? Yeah. I've got a couple of other things here. You don't mind. So let me go here. So as you, as you get to the website, the first thing you notice is that there's a lot of different things on it. And that, that is really, <clears throat> in a sense, the map of my creative life because this always changes. And what it indicates to anyone who looks at it is what does this guy do? He does different <laughs> things, you know, he's different things photographically, different things uh, non-photographically. Um, this, this is sort of my world of uh, teaching and workshops. So I change these from time to time because I generally bounce around from one medium to another. Uh, these are physical assemblages that are actual 3D things I put together. And it's all one voice, it's all from one crazy brain, but I can't do any one kind of photography. And I think that's why I never went into commercial photography because there wasn't any one thing that really called me and said, be really good at this. So, my journey is partly as I travel, and my journey is partly as I cruise through different phases of my life and try different things. Um, I've been a photo illustrator since about um, 1997. So what do you mean by a photo illustrator? Well, that's a good question, John. Photo illustration to me is something that combines photography and physical objects. Um, I find things that speak to me. I believe in um, the kinesthetic quality of objects. Objects to me hold, hold um, history and meaning, uh, especially things that people use like old tools or old things that people worked with in their life. So I collect the objects because they attract me, um, much the same way photographers are drawn to uh, decomposing buildings and things that are locked and abandoned. We love that texture, that richness, and that history. So these objects speak to me, and um, I combine them in a very intuitive sense with photographs to form ideas or stories. So the word storytelling to me really is about not just making a photograph and attaching meaning to it, but by starting with an idea and then finding the things or attracting the things to me that bring that story out for other people to see. That's kind of the, mm -hmm. the overarching idea. So this is called The Farmer's Daughter. Um, I know a painter in Maine, John Wally, who Eric Leskinen might know. And um, John's a phenomenal man you know, on a number of levels. But one of the things he does is he paints still lifes that he puts together of objects that speak to him the same way objects speak to me. So we have a kinship there. And this came out of one of my workshops in Maine, where I was talking about combining photography and objects to make a new, a new artistic item. So what we have here is a photograph, a photograph of a bird's nest. Uh, this is a vintage photograph found in a store. And then an object that I found in another store that was some kind of box of unknown origin, maybe about a foot square or less. Every time I go to Maine with a small suitcase, I come back with two. That's one of my problems. <laughs> um, 
so for me, photo illustrations can take a number of levels. Uh, for instance, most people have a look, or at least they try to develop a cohesive look, because if you're working in fine art, galleries want a cohesive look, which is one of the reasons why gallerists don't know what to do with me, because everything I do ah. changes from time to time. Um, this is an allegorical story uh, for my best friend who passed away in 2013, but it was about his love and uh, my love for a natural history for skulls and for anything that's left behind after something dies or has gone through its life cycle. And also just, we lived in Brooklyn together. We saw a lot of things happen in Brooklyn and New York while we lived there, we, things happened to us. And so this is sort of a symbolic representation of some of our most bizarre years together. We also saw black magic being performed and uh, Santeria being performed in the park and it wasn't unusual to be walking to school with Jeff to Pratt Institute and suddenly see um, a, a goat skull covered with uh, candle wax on fire on a tree. So that's a little bit of my, that's dipping down into the dark surreal history that I <laughs> occupy. Um, so these are photo illustrations in that they tell a story in the medium of photography and Photoshop or photography and illustration. Some of these are hand worked on afterwards, but this here was um, was something I, it was a self assignment, actually it was a group assignment amongst a couple of us for the word fertility. Um, so it kind of depicts the uh, fertility cycle if you start with uh, conception to to birth in a, in a more metaphorical way than directly. So photo illustrations to me can be as exotic and complex as this or as simple as just a, a triptych that's put together in a somewhat different way. Mm -hmm. um, I just, this, this website just simply, there we go. Looks like I have to hit a command there. When I work commercially in photo illustration, they're by topic. Uh, my clients occupy these different uh, topics or, or uh, genres of business. So for health and psychology, I produce these visuals that depict a specific assignment. Um, some of these are self assignments that I would do in order to practice my skill set in Photoshop and in conceptualization. Mm -hmm. um, this one happened to be something I did just as um, Bush was elected and the world had a lot of financial crisis going on. And I was asked to do a piece on um, balancing psycho psychological economy. Um, I have a question for you. Yeah. Are any of these, are all of these um, available uh, in galleries? Not in any current galleries. I, I was carried by a gallery at one time that's no longer in business in New York. Um, I do occasionally sell prints of these. Uh, one man in uh, Baltimore just bought a whole set of these of 30. And, and I'm gonna ask <laughs> questions that only I can ask. Um, and you do, you do these for yourself, for mental gymnastics, so, so to speak? Um, I do them because I have an idea that I can't get out of my brain. And so okay. I, have to, I have to realize it in some tangible fashion. It's also a way for me to experiment with techniques. So fear came out of the fact that I discovered a photograph of my mother dancing on stage when she was a child. And this isn't the photograph but I've had another photograph of a dancer from a dance studio in Capitol Hill here in Seattle from the 50s. And I realized that my mother at one time in her life was a very bold, fearless little girl, the way a lot of little girls are. Um, so completely different from the woman she is now at 90. And I wanted to do something that kind of honored her fearlessness and her stage fright that she has now. 
And so it's interesting. Uh, she was the woman who was uh, assistant to her brother, who was a traveling magician. She was the girl who was cut wow. in half, sawed in half. She was the one who brought the rabbit out, all the traditional stuff at that time. Mm -hmm. So I just want to do a piece uh, from a series I did um, for this group called the Cranial Crowbar, which I started, which was a group of creative people who'd get together every month, talk about creativity. Um, and then we'd cast out a phrase or a word, in this case, the word fear, and everybody went about it their own way. A month later, we'd get together and look at what we'd done. That is that one group, we ran it for six or seven years, and it gave birth to so many incredible uh, assignments that we did for, e for each other and for ourselves. And those in turn brought me work because I'd put them up online like this, and some art director would find it uh, based on whatever search he was doing and uh, give me assignment work. You know, so, but some of these were self assignments and some were actual assignments. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So the ones for the cranial crowbar were considered self assignments. They were non-commercial. Um, but even when I had nothing cast in front of me to do, I would continue to develop things. My mind is kind of a giant bee's nest of ideas and I'm, always trying to slow it down enough to find the one B that has the idea I need to do that day. That's part of my super ADD process. <laughs> when, when, when you were talking about you plan out the images mm -hmm. and then you go about collecting the things that you need right. for that plan, <clears throat> what happens in the process of doing that if all of a sudden, as you're collecting and putting things together, um, you, you, do you ever have a detour to go oh, someplace boy. else? That's a great question. And it's, it's exactly where I was headed with this, is that no matter what idea I come up with, I might make a small thumbnail sketch of the idea just to root down something to start with. Everything always evolves and morphs and metamorphoses during that time because the human nature, at least my human nature, is as soon as I see something, something else comes to my mind. And that's the wonderful rabbit hole serpentine direction of creativity itself is that it doesn't lock down. True creativity is open, is open source, if you will, or open ended and that anything can enter and influence it um, from for me, if I. I sometimes tune into um, uh, music videos, music that I would never listen to, and I listen to it, but not watch it. And while I'm listening to it, strange things unlock in my brain that have nothing to do with music, nothing to do with it. If I go to a performance, I bring a drawing pad just big enough to sit on my knee, and I might make a few notes or sketches. So it's a constant process of uh, influence. That's a great question, Mike. I, 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 um, I thought that I was the only one, but, <laughs> but you know, one, one uh, two, two other things, and I'll, then I'll try to shut up. Um, the first thing is I thoroughly enjoy uh, your articulation of what your process is. However, and I, I uh -oh. know, I, no, 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 no. However, I have a feeling that there's the majority of people watching this have no clue what the meaning is of some of the words that you speak. Hmm. But so it's, it's, it's really very um, enlightening to hear um, something at a much higher level. Uh, that that's 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 just for me that's um, pretty neat i would be curious to know if anyone has any questions along the way um around something that i say because i really want to reach no, you no. guys i want to make sure everyone um is served in a sense the, the the other part of this is as i was quickly going through your website earlier this morning, 
there were two things that I noticed about the site. Number one, I thought the images were, were, were terrific, absolutely terrific in terms of uh, fine art. All of it, even, even your commercial work, to me, it looked like fine art. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet I was trying to find an area on your website that, that indicated how, how big the images are and the, you know, the size and the prices. I couldn't find it. And I found that unusual until I looked at the, uh, your, your typeset and the size of your fonts. And it indicated to me at every single one of the websites that I've ever gone to that 90% of all the fine art photographers use little tiny size fonts. And I don't know why. Um, uh, 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 on the page, the little tiny fonts and a lot of dead space around it. I don't know why, but that's sort of a, an indicator to me that this is a, uh, an image maker, an artist that uh, uh, deals in fine art, as opposed to <laughs> me including everybody else that I know that is um, 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 expanding uh, the, 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 the first letter of every sentence and, and doing all kinds of um, uh, graphic and uh, marketing techniques like capture the uh, attention of the viewer along with the image that's being shown. Well, um, I want the photographs or I want the artwork to dominate. That's one thing. Um, I also really don't want to put that much. I, I, I dare I dare use the word ego into the website so that it's got my name large. It's got my subjects large. I want really all of that to take a background. The same way I want my camera to take a background when I'm out shooting. It's in front of my face, but I don't want the device itself to be what I'm doing. I want yeah, it to be the medium. But that's different. But that's well, different. well, hear me out. Hear me out. Yeah. My, my thinking is that I really want the images to be navigable. I want people to be able to find things, even though there's nothing logical about the way I've broken things up except for my own inner logic. And um, the work itself is balanced between personal work and commercial work, but I consider it to be all my work. Mm -hmm. There's nothing up here at all that was directed by the client. The only time it is, is when I have a topic that I have to illustrate for editorial or a product or a subject, but there's nothing that anyone else's hands are on. And th the reason is, is because the only clients I take are ones that let me do what I do. Within reason, the fact that they're, they're commissioning the piece, they have to have some say as to what's included as a subject. But most of the time I was handed, for instance, down in here, um, I'd be handed the topic. Whoops, let me get back to this one. The topic has to do with sports, inju sports injuries in high school sports, sports teams. And it has to do, it really has to do with what happens and um, when kids get forced back into the game when they've actually been injured by the, by the, by the, the rah rah attitude, the parents. Um, influence the teams. So what I'm saying is that everything on this website is just an extension of my brain and an influential conversation with the art director. So I want, I want the images to dominate. And as far as the typography, that's just secondary. Why would a menu be any larger than that? It's just a navigation piece. Mm -hmm. And as far as the fine art aspect of it that you're talking about, I might take that as a compliment. Um, although I think that a lot of these are, are quite commercial looking such as this. But when you get up into the projects, these are the things that are more personally generated. Uh, to, to some degree, I agree with what you're saying, except 
or until you get to the point of the actual website. The website is being used for what purpose? It's your marketing tool. It's your advertising piece, so to mm -hmm. speak. No different than going into a restaurant and looking at a menu. Yeah, here it is. Right, but the menu for this gastronomical uh, 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 restaurant uh, or visual restaurant uh, is, is very small. Um, I keep on wanting to go like this. Yeah, but... I don't, I, don't, taking, I, don't, I don't think it's taking you away from the actual image. Uh-huh. Well, I think we're getting away from the creativity. Yeah, I, I feel like I feel like we're 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 down in some kind of uh, you know okay. user experience yeah. conversation that I'd love <laughs> to have with you outside, but I don't think it, it 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 hits the mark for me. I don't really want to talk about it only because it's so secondary to the to the topic at hand, and it's I think as readable as it needs to be, especially yeah. on on okay. um, mobile devices and where it needs to go. Yeah. So Carol's asking, what did you take away from people like Alexei Brodovich? that you still use today? What do I take away from him? Hmm. I don't. I, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't even know how to respond to that, really. Okay. I, I, I can't relate to the question specifically. I, I would Carol, like to know more about... Carol, if you want to unmute and ask more, something more specific. Uh, yeah, I would like to know a little bit more specifically what it is about that question that... Well, I, I, he was such a... Um... He was such a, a unique art director for his time and changed the way everybody looked at magazine layout, typography with photographs, really cutting edge photographs. And so, I don't know, you said you really didn't have any mentors, but I wonder while you were at Pratt, were there people like him that kind mm -hmm. of stay in your in your thought while you are doing new things. Exactly. So rather Sorry, than call them mentors, yeah. I call them influences. Okay. Um, I spent a lot of, the knees on all of my jeans were always torn because I'd spend so much time on my knees from the time I was a kid till the time I graduated Pratt, looking at books right below the bookshelves they were on and compu uh, um, Communication Arts and Print Magazine were the two premier magazines for the visual arts and have been for many years. And um, art directors like himself, art directors like Art Paul, who was the art director for Playboy for many, many years. You know, people, when people hear the word Playboy, they think of nude women in, in editorial. But if you'd ever opened the magazine and saw the beauty of typography and design, whoops, my camera went off. Um, see the beautiful art direction of design and typography to me the illustrators that were hired and photographers that were hired to do the more editorial work were the best of the best of the best and in his art direction of that really influenced me it was my dream to always to get an illustration assignment a uh, photo illustration assignment with with playboy but never happened <laughs> so other art directors other designers a couple of whom i interviewed with when i was in new york they their work influenced me constantly. But I think for me, it was never an attachment to any one person. It was just that um, attention deficit gathering of things that I liked, tearing them out of books and magazines, pinning them up on my bulletin board and having a whole conglomeration of things like that. Um, yeah. That's my process. Yeah, so Paul Bannon was sort of asking the same question of their, mm -hmm. instead of mentors, are there heroes you had? And I think that's what you're touching on there. For sure. So one of my photographic heroes. So first of all, I have to, I have to just say this, and I pr probably rewrite my about page. Um, I really got interested in surrealistic art very, very early, very young in life, um, probably by the time I was about seven and on. And painters like um, Bruegel, Hieronymus Bosch, Dali, Magritte, Magritte especially. Magritte blew my mind. The simplicity. <laughs> of his work, the flatness of his imagery and the simplicity of his ideas were so inventive to me that I never forgot it and neither did the rest of the art world apparently. 
Yeah, um, last year I got to see some of his work in person in Scotland yes. and some of the museums. It was amazing just to, to see them. Absolutely. I mean, here's a record cover for a blues musician. Oh, I stopped your share for a while, so reshare, please. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. Here we go. Let me get back to that. I'm going to hit Safari, and I think there we go. Now yep. we have a full size web pipe. Um, so, this here, I mean, is that not Renee Magritte? Exactly. So, my heroes, you know, it's a great question. My heroes were the Surrealists, really, um, and, and photographers as well. Um, Jerry Yulesman, anybody know Jerry Yulesman's work? Of course. Phenomenal, phenomenal thinker and photographer and craftsman. There is no craftsmanship like that um, in in the dark room. I mean, yes, there are people who can do what Jerry can do, but the way he did it, when he did it, and the thoughts that he put together were so incredibly influential on my... In fact, I never really wanted to... I, I, I did traditional illustration with traditional media, but then I shelved it for a while because what I really wanted to do was take photographs and lay them over each other in a way that was creative the way the surrealists did with paint and so it took almost 30 years for photoshop to mature to the point where i could fluidly and in real time put my ideas together as i thought of them and i can tell you that if i open up any of these early illustrations um this, this one here is probably from about 2002 um there are dozens and dozens of layers that are turned off because those are the subset ideas or those are the rabbit hole ideas. And I keep them there because when I teach and I bring those, those layered files in, um, I sometimes turn on those layers to show the process that's so uh, erratic, like a butterfly flying around a garden looking for a place to land. Um, I didn't mention my officiant. Dive into the mind of David. Yeah, well, uh, butterflies and me go way back. I started collecting them when I was a kid and uh, have a ridiculous collection that I have to do something with very soon. <laughs> um, so all of these, uh, just going back to the idea of, of mentors or influences, um, I was very much influenced by Rolling Stone magazine, um, not necessarily because of the wonderful covers done by the great photographers or the inside work, but also the entire record industry was my first library of contemporary art, right? We got a 12 inch square of the best of the best illustrators, uh, art directors, photographers working at the time who were interpreting something that's intangible music. Sure, remember hypnosis? Ah, <laughs> yeah, there's another name. Okay, Hyp <laughs> hypnosis was God, you know, hypnosis was the perfect intersection of conceptual ideas and surreal photography, right? Yep. When I was at Warner Brothers, I never told my director this, but I said, I said to myself, um, my goal is to come up with an idea good enough that when I sell it, I can hire hypnosis to do it. <laughs> I, I got one chance. Um, and that was um, working with uh, Rush, doing, mm -hmm. uh, doing a couple of pieces with them. So all of these things came from different parts of my life or my research. Um, I love circus sideshows, always been attracted to the dark side of the human experience and our culture. And so this piece here is based on the idea of a circus sideshow poster, right? Those big cloth banners they'd string up before a sideshow was brought out to the audience. Um, I think because there was magic and uh, fantasy in my my parents and my uncle's lives, they in, they in a sense were sideshow people. Huh. Did you I photograph that in my living room that looks like my purple chair? <laughs> oh, neat. Yes. Yeah. I used to call my, I used to call my family tree, the Jewish circus. <laughs> uh, this piece here is very much based on something that I would say draws from Magritte in a small way. Um, and certainly someone else, um, uh, this man, Stanley Tukey Williams, was the co-founder of the Crips, the gang, the Crips. And when he was incarcerated for life, um, he started writing books towards children 
to keep them off the streets, to keep them out of gangs. And this was kind of his redemption, his way of, of saying, okay, I'm changing, giving back. And so there was Fox Network was making a movie and they said, we need something that shows him um, for this article that was going to be um, <clears throat> on the cover of the Baltimore Sun. No, this was the LA Times. And they wanted to show an impartial objective view of Tukey Williams in prison but potentially going to be pardoned for his work towards keeping kids off the street. So these are the kind of assignments that were tossed at me and I had maybe anywhere from 72 hours to two weeks to do them. So you have to think quickly, you have to sketch quickly, put things out there. Um, I think what I'd love to do is segue into something more photographic, more, more familiar okay. on that level. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually redoing this whole section because as I go through it and I look at it, I see um, tones showing up online that aren't the tones I, I really want. These pieces I assembled and I called it dreams and visions because to me, to me, they really speak to a feeling. And when I photograph, which is a hundred percent polar opposite from when I illustrate, I'm out there, maybe daydreaming as I walk with a camera, but also still coming up with concepts. I sort of pre-visualize something I would like to photograph. And that I call intentional photography. One of the things I love to um, work with with my students. Where you might be able to access a relaxed state when you're out photographing, which usually means separating yourself from a group of people and not speaking. And in that state, my mind goes into a slight daydream where I might look at a beautiful tree or something else. Fog is a favorite medium to separate foreground and background. And I dream into it just slightly enough so that it influences how I want to photograph it. Um, <clears throat> for instance, I was vacationing on Lopez Island up here in the San Juan Islands. It rained the entire time I was there. And I was bicycling around just to sort of get out of the B&B &B that I was staying in. And I came across an orchard and I was instantly reminded of a daydream that I'd had, or maybe it was a night dream, I don't even know, of a hand coming up through the ground with birds circling the hand. And when I saw this particular tree, <clears throat> pardon me, it really looked like a hand coming out of the ground. And I saw blackbirds in the tree and they were socializing. They were flying around, then they were landing, then they were noisily flying around. And I, I uh, grabbed my camera and made a couple of snapshots and then raced back, got my tripod set up in the rain with a bag over the camera and made a series of photographs of the birds alighting and flying around the tree. And because I was on a tripod, all of these photographs had the same still subject, but the birds were changing. I put that all into Photoshop in layers and then layered out, or I should say layered in the birds that I liked and masked out the ones I didn't until I got something close to what my vision was but without it becoming a shape necessarily in the sky, but just sort of a randomness. And then I toned it based on some work I was doing with another photographer at the time, uh, Phil Borges, who uses a warm tone mask and a cool tone background. And um, that's kind of how these things evolve. Yeah, so, Paul is asking, did you ever see this tree before the daydream or did <clears throat> no, you come back I, to it? I'd had the daydream many years earlier hmm. and, and for many times. It's a symbolic dream. I'm sure that if I went to a therapist, they'd be able to help <laughs> me unravel it, but I may not want to know exactly <laughs> what that means. Um, there's a lot of hey, I'm a Scorpio. There's a lot of dark surrealism in my brain, you know, and I look for ways to pull it out. Um, so what I wrote here is this, dreams and visions. As I attempt to sleep, there's a brief indescribable moment where my consciousness teeters on a narrow step between here and the infinite. The slightest movement, sound, or shifting light can yank me back into wakefulness. I must then begin again, counting backwards from 100 to 41, or 141. 
Equally ephemeral is the calm velvet whisper of actual sleep where I float through landscapes of light and form that blends into a surreal edgeless space. Focus then softens and colors fade into a palette of barely tinted grays. I often see birds in my drifting state either flying alone or in slow motion waves of murmuration. In my dreams, trees are hands, birds are spirits, and shifting fog veils an unrelenting sun. So by writing that many years after I started this feeling of images, I wouldn't call it a series, I'd call it kind of just a feeling. Um, I actually was articulating the seeds of the ideas that I feel bring these into a cohesive space for me. Does that make any sense whatsoever? <laughs> yes. And people in the audience, you're welcome to unmute and join in if you have questions or comments or answers. Yeah, please do. Shut me up. <laughs> um, I don't I remember this place. Do you? Yeah, I, I go there all the time. I mean, I probably have visited this place 200 times. It's a, it's a favorite place in Discovery Park here in the Magnolia neighborhood. Um, this was also a self-assignment, the words in between. So think about this. If you're looking for a creative jolt here in the pandemic, give yourself a phrase, grab it off a book cover, um, a poem, the news. Give yourself a phrase that's open-ended, that doesn't have a visual attachment to it, like a cat. And go out and try to depict that concept, whatever those words mean to you. Try to depict it at least three different ways, meaning in three different photographs or collages or whatever it is you do. By doing that, you force your mind into a very relaxed and yet creative state where you're doing a little bit of a problem solving but more so what you're doing is you're opening up your mind to the possibility that you can depict something intangible and non-visual with a camera. And even if you're a portrait photographer, an architectural photographer, a landscape photographer, no matter what kind of photography or artwork you do, an exercise like that is just a way of kind of flicking the brain or what I call crowbarring the ideas out, giving yourself a way of free associating. Yeah, I just did something like that with the phrase carried away. And I just took two of those wooden mannequins, a hand mannequin and a miniature mannequin and put the miniature mannequin in the hand and put it in different situations as the one hand is carrying the other mannequin away. Wow. I think I have some of those over on Instagram. Oh, I definitely want to trip over and see those. Yeah. So so these are, these are all different moments. Um, and none of these were preconceived except for the ones that, uh, that I point out as being kind of self-assignments. The rest were just things that I found that had the same feeling to me um, that fit the, my dreams and visions project. So it's a life project. Um, I'm way behind adding images to the series. Um, you know, things like this, I just put together as an afterthought because every time it's foggy, I drop whatever I'm doing and I get out. What, day or night, I don't care. If someone texts me and says, it's foggy, why are you in bed? I'll be out. This was just the other night. Remember that wonderful fog we had here in Seattle? We have a lot of wonderful fog here in Seattle. But uh, yes. Well, less than I thought when I was moving here. I thought, leaving here from Brooklyn, I thought, I'm going to the world of endless fog. It's the Pacific Northwest. Well, <laughs> well. not so much. Um, but also, I, I just want to say that this is, a, this is a project from 2005. This was right after Katrina happened in uh, the Gulf in New Orleans and uh, Louisiana. And I was called to work there with a friend who was doing a book. And um, I had no idea what I was going to do. So for me, photography can be as ethereal as a fine art where I get to decide what I want to do, which is always in the background. But also I respond to situations that draw me um, to make some kind of personal statement. 
around the situation. We, we went down there to volunteer. They said, there's nothing we can do without you signing a contract and being here for at least a month. So we couldn't do it. So we, we just photographed. And my idea was to look at the grand landscape, see the destruction, uh, to really feel into it. So we spent a day walking around without cameras and very quickly um, just respond to, to what was there. Um, so I'll just read this quickly because I think it's pertinent to the discussion. Taken from the heart, images of intimate loss. Our connections to our homes and to the people in our lives is of great importance to us. We form meaningful attachments to favorite possessions, artifacts of personal history, or items of daily ritual, life and ritual. If these connections are suddenly lost or broken, we may be changed sometimes forever. Just as a human face evokes the spectrum of emotions, I also believe that objects and rooms can reveal a soulful presence. To explore the disconnection experienced by hurricane and flood victims evicted from their homes, I made a series of unpopulated object portraits. I did not intend to describe the enormity of their loss, but rather the wrenching subtlety of it. The once whole communities now represented by the decomposing details that remained. These photographs record items stripped from their homes and taken from their hearts. My hope is that these images cause reflection on what is important and personally meaningful and to strengthen our bonds to whom and what we never want to lose. It's in Spanish because I've been asked to show this in Latin American countries mm -hmm. that are also involved in this kind of disaster. So what we do as photographers or artists is we respond to our environment. And when I'm put in a place or when I fly to a place like this, I just bury myself into my emotional response from it. Um, I've never photographed while crying before this. I literally was crying for days and it was the most gut-wrenching experience I've ever had. Um, and I think that it really taught me a lot about how I respond in different conditions to what's there. I tried to make photographs that symbolized what happened there, but also to try to make photographs that had some kind of beauty in them, because for me, tragedy and beauty are interlocked. It's the, it's the human experience. And however, we all react differently to what we see. And many, many photographers, emerging, amateur, whatever you want to call them, professional, any level, all responded from inside themselves, except for reporters who might have been assigned to cover a specific aspect. And so sometimes something as graphic as this blue hole in the wall. It looks like a graphic. It's unusual. If you didn't know the context and location of this photograph, you'd wonder what the heck was going on here. But in the scope of it, if I see this as a screaming face, and that's just how I responded to it. It's like a, a head on its side. So we all saw lots and lots of photographs like this in the medium, but what I wanted to do with each of these was, was rivet the idea that these are very personal loss. Of course, there was the overarching situations as well. You know, this boy here, um, he came home, found his keyboard and his bicycle completely engulfed in, in cinder blocks and uh, caved in roof. And his response was to punch the wall that he put all his favorite sports icons and rappers photographs on. So his own or inner turmoil resulted in his own expression of punching the wall. And I thought that that was kind of incredible. So this one photograph to me symbolizes that conflict. Things as maybe graphically subtle as this, this room that was once filled with people's belongings in this house, flooded all the way up to this line. I don't know if you can see my yes, cursor. Yes, you can see the cursor. See that line? Yes. The water flooded up to this high and then drained out slowly, sucking all their belongings out through the doors and windows. Not all the belongings that you don't see here. Some of those things were moved out before the second wave of floods which is why there's not a single thing in the room. And then the mud is left behind on a linoleum floor. 
which dries in cups and cracks like China. So it was a very profoundly unusual environment to be in. Looks like a combination of some scenes of uh, a desert ice scene with the mud. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, while I was in this building, which was a high school, um, they were they were bullhorning us to get out. <laughs> get out. We're going to bulldoze this building. I didn't want them to touch the scenario. This was incredible, an incredible wealth of information that needed to be photographed and cataloged and then given given to the media, um, as well as to traveled around the world in a gallery exhibit with a lot of other photographers. So, so powerful. Um, all of these were shot with a Pentax 6x7 on um, Fujichrome Provia 220 roll film um, on a strong tripod. And there are a couple of these photographs where there's a small puddle of my own making as I as I was literally coating the back of my camera with, uh, with tears. It was a very, very subtle uh, and wrenching situation. This photograph really riveted me when I saw it. it. It looks exactly like my mother did at that age. So it was very haunting to see this. Uh, she's, she's of course still around, but uh, it was very bizarre. So I do, tend to have somewhat of a dark sensibility. Um, I'm attracted to things that are not always very pleasant and happy. Although when I shoot landscapes, I'm just as likely to shoot a gorgeous sunset as the next person. But I think that when I really look at my id, you know, what's inside me, there's a more profound curiosity about the things that, that are more um, emotionally dense. So those are often my personal subjects. That's a beautiful, project, David. Thank um, you very much, Jerry. Yeah, we recently had uh, quite a fire here in Southern Oregon. And so many of those images remind me of the images I, I've seen here. And we actually had, I don't recall what they're called, but they had um, people in hazmat suits that would go in and try to you know, bring out those kinds of objects to the people they went in and destroyed the area. And I, I thought that was such a wonderful thing. And this it, it is. Um, this reminds me of it. Thanks for letting me know about that effort. Um, at Katrina, no one expected this to happen to the level it did. I found people's personal objects almost as far as a mile from their original location. And I was able to trace some of these objects based on things that were found with them and written. And it was really, it was really a psychological kick in the head to, to understand the power of what happened just based on objects themselves. And partly I put up a large gallery of over 200 images with people's objects so that people could find them again. And that got circulated to groups online at the time. Well, that's a beautiful effort. Hmm. Well, thanks. Um, the sad thing about this is some of this looks like your trips to Cuba or my trips to Cuba. Um, yeah. You know, the, the, the situation there and there. It does. Um, whoops, that's not what I meant to hit. Um, I think what you might be referring to is just the, the decomposition of, of mm -hmm. personal space and also the knowledge that as, as we've all seen many, many photographs of Cuba, and we're all familiar with these textures, this kind of scaling uh, decomposition, the, the, the other story, and um, I, I don't want to make this whole, <laughs> this whole <laughs> online thing about darkness, but here we are, and darkness is also beauty and reveals it later. Um, when it rains really hard in Cuba, when they get tropical storms and hurricanes, uh, buildings fall apart and they fall apart without notice. John knows this mm -hmm. and anything can happen when that happens. So um, it's kind of incredible. Who here today hasn't been to Cuba? Just has not been. Up. Make it a part of your life 
to, to find a way of getting to Cuba. It is legal for Americans to go there with a licensed tour group, but even if tours aren't your thing, you can arrange to do that individually. You can also go on tours that are very small group, like the ones that I put together or someone else puts together where we all have individual space and lots of time to photograph. But it is a place that's unlike no other visually and culturally and the way the people respond to photographers is very unusual. Um, they welcome it. Um, as much as the US has tried to darken the, our perception of what Cuba is over time politically and otherwise, Cubans are artists and they're given they're given full permission to practice their art it's it's a government supported most of the time it's a very heavily government supported effort as well um, photographers working in cuba who are able to show their work outside of cuba can become quite well to do uh, much more easily than in some countries john i'm sure that you interfaced yes. with many of them while you're there. Yeah, it's it's pretty pretty amazing, and the ingenuity of people there, and fixing cameras and cars, and just keeping things working. They're they're amazing people, very mm -hmm. kind. As you say, you walk down the street and they run out to you and ask you to take their picture, as opposed to America, where people hide from you. Yeah, and you get into the habit of reacting as a photographer because you're there and you're excited and you're having a personal interaction. And what you have to do is you have to take the picture that they want you to take, which is. <laughs> that one or that one or whatever you get you get all kinds of finger symbols and gang signs and everything that they think you want to see but then you keep shooting while you're talking to them and that's when you see mm -hmm. real cuba or when you they get bored with you and they start talking to the people who were there when you walked up but all kinds of incredible experiences happen um and one of the things that I learned to do, and if I, I don't really have this gentleman as a mentor, but I, I advise everyone to look at his books and read them. His name is Sam Abel. Mm -hmm. He's a oh. National Geographic photographer of, 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 and a prominent thinker and a gentleman. And uh, the thing that he said, because I'd never really photographed on the streets until I went there in 2014 um, with the Fujifilm camera that I bought at the time, the X-T1, and we were walking along on a project with several other photographers called um, Footsteps, Cuban Footsteps, uh, going where Walker Evans had gone and photographing contemporary Cuba in those locations. And he said, design your photographs from the background forward. Meaning think about what the background mm -hmm. is, create the layers of your image from the background forward. I think I'd always done that in my brain, but I'd never really put it to words. And once it was put to words, it made so much sense. It, it had to do with information and designing the frame. Yeah, so the pandemic's probably put a little bit of a crush on your travels. Do you have things coming up? Are you still <laughs> planning for, for 2021 or 22? I am, yeah. I plan on returning to the places that I wanted to go in, in uh, 2020. Uh, Cuba is one of them for sure. I've been in touch with people all the time there to find out, you know, what's the political temperature there? What's the economic temperature there? Um, they are really hurting without tourism as, as is most of the big cities in the world um, that have tourism as a partial or main economy. But it's one of the places that I've been to, what, seven times now in a row. And um, it's, I can't stop. It's partially the people who I've met there and it's partially the place itself and the vibe. I expect it'll be a very different place when I next go there. Um, a long spell without a, a strong economic, um, let me, I think my camera went off and try to fix that for you. Um, a long spell without the economy of tourism has really hurt Cuba. So we'll see, we'll see what it's like to go back there again. I think it'll be a, a photographic mission with a financial um, component as well. This photograph um, I took because I'm in love with industrial chaos, for one thing, as a subject and as a, as a look. I also love, uh, as I think I said before, um, vintage technology. And this is the photograph I use when my students, we have a, a little Zoom session or a Skype session before the trip where we all kind of get together and talk about what's coming up. And this is the photograph I show when they ask me whether they should bring a surge protector. <laughs> and I say- I was asking if the wires are live. 
I say that that's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were they were live, but they aren't there anymore. I went back and this place is all cleaned up. It's really depressing. Yeah, if you see over on the side there, there's some newer electrical panels. Yep. And, this yeah. is the yeah, this is the new Havana. This this is all gone now. But these things date back to the thirties. Uh, it's kind and of they have incredible. a mixture of both two, 110 and 220, so you got to really be careful. Uh, if you plug a surge suppressor into a 220, it's a 110, they go poof. And they have every every voltage in between. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. Pr pretty amazing. So, um, yeah, John. Yeah, so Carol had a, a question a little back about your um, – the warm tone mask and the cool tone background of that tree. Mm -hmm. And if you could say a little bit more about that. Certainly. Let me go back to that. Oh, well, it I can't click it. almost has the feeling of a Holga. Well, that was intentional. Um, okay. I was using a Holga at the time, and I loved the Holga camera. I didn't have one on that trip, and I probably would have pulled it out because I can use those in the rain and not care about them. <laughs> but um, that... That is toned, that's toned using a mask in Photoshop. So I actually make a mask and I tint the masked portion in one direction towards warm and I tint the reverse of that towards cool. And I learned or was attracted to that technique by seeing the work of Phil Borges, who did a wonderful book called Tibetan Portrait. Right around the time I moved to Seattle, I met him. I looked him up in the white pages, remember that. <laughs> and I had seen one of his pieces hanging at the Benham Gallery down on uh, First Avenue. First Ave, yep. Right? And I said, oh, my God, this work is beautiful. And I need to meet the man who made it. And I looked him up, and um, we talked, and he told me about the Tibetan Portrait Project. Um, and I said, you know, is there any way we can meet? And he said, yeah, I'm actually, maybe you can tell me, uh, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm currently a graphic designer. And he said, oh, I need someone to do a poster for this book. Um, and I said, great, let's, let's do a trade. I'd love one of your <laughs> photographs. So he gave me a triptych of photographs from that, uh, that book. And I, in looking at that day after day, I just fell in love with the aesthetic of the warm and cool split toning. But this kind of split toning you don't do with sliders, you do it more with masks, and then you apply the tinting. I hope that that comes close to <laughs> responding to that inquiry. So what are some of the other places you want to travel again to? Um, I want to do a trip to Prague. Mm -hmm. um, I did a little self-motivated uh, trip to Prague in um, 2019, and I loved it very much, but I didn't want to focus on the tourist sites that are most prominent. I went outside and went to a number of different areas. So Prague, um, I want to go back to Portugal and do a workshop there. I'm very much organizing uh, something in Sri Lanka and in Vietnam. So uh, India was from was phenomenal. Carol, do you remember India? <laughs> you're, you're muted, Carol. Okay. I, I sprung that on her, sorry. <laughs> um, do you remember the hotel that we stayed at in Bundy? Uh, I believe I do. There was a felt, a felted rug in the breakfast room there. And I haven't been able to find them. They don't make them in India anymore, but they do make them in Kazakhstan mm. and Uzbekistan. And so that's the next place on my list. Ah, uh, so I loved organized chaos. This is disorganized <laughs> chaos, but what it's organized is it's a box. It's like an assemblage, right? It's like its own incredible assemblage. Can, imagine how much time it took for all of that to accumulate to the point where it's bending the shelves and discoloring the wood. And I don't know, I think most people would pass that and go gross. At least everyone in my family would. <laughs> um, but to me, I just light up when I see that. It, it yeah. even has that feel of the Cuban entryway, look, you know, that. Look at the Mac, Mac 2SI in the corner there. The what? Uh, 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 Macintosh oh, 2SI. Yeah. Uh, I'm, not, that... I'm not sure that is, but whatever. I thought it was a television, but. <laughs> no, no, look at, look at the, uh, uh, the, the, the disc that you put in the front. 
just underneath the edge. Yeah, yeah. it, it yeah. is a computer. Speakers, I don't know what it is. But anyway, speakers on the side. I forgot yes. about that one. So this is the best bike shop ever. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that trip really blew my mind as well. And I found Indy to be a lot, uh, very similar to Cuba in, in the way we were treated and the effusiveness of the people, their, their patience with photographers, um, their generosity. I mean, we traveled at a fairly high level in terms of our comfort zone and our, 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 um, our access. But um, I really want to go back. So Varanasi is a place that was a side trip on that trip. And Varanasi is a place I'm definitely going to be taking people as soon as the pandemic is over. It is, um, it is an amazing place. This is Varanasi. This is way, way out. This is, uh, remember, we went to this place. Uh, this is way, way out. It took us about, oh, God, I don't know, six hours in a bus or more. But um, it was a carnival and livestock trading fair way the hell out in the middle of nowhere and it, it was just incredible um i'm really learning to react to moments and i set my camera to high shutter speed of 750th and i got down low right even with this trampoline and i watched this kid tumble and i just kept snapping not knowing what my camera would would capture and later when i found this i love the way his feet are tangently right on the edge of that uh ferris wheel it looks like he's walking up the side of it oh show him the one of the motorcycle though that's my favorite photo of all time <laughs> look at that yeah shadows the at the top of everybody who's watching i just love the photo. thank you i think it's my the favorite of picture death. of the trip one of my favorite pictures of the trip i have so many that was it that was the most that was one of the most high yield trips I've ever made in terms of yeah. photographs. You know, I was there as a, as a co facilitator of the trip with David Robbins, who's amazing. Um, and uh, we were all kind of separated at one point. And I, I heard them, I heard the speakers calling out this event in, in uh, Hindi. I didn't understand a word of it and they were blaring tin speakers. So it was a real cacophony that I was trying to really shut out. And when I saw this, this arena all made of wood, a big circle, like a giant salad spinner, exactly what it looked like from the outside <laughs> with posters all over it. I was curious and I went up and looked at what was going on. It was just an empty bowl. There were two motorcycles on the ground and a white car and a couple people. And eventually um, they started to uh, drive around. The idea is that a man on a motorcycle goes around in a circle until he gains enough speed that he can ride up the inside of the bowl, which is fully vertical, mm -hmm. but it works just like a salad spinner. <laughs> only centrifugal force, huh? Yeah, only the salad's doing the spinning <laughs> and not the spinner. And then did they did they do the same with the car? Well, here's what happens. So one motorcycle goes around, and then a second motorcycle goes around the opposite direction. It goes up the wall and they have to miss each other by a very narrow margin. But here's the fun part. One man puts a machete in his mouth with the blade facing outwards and the other man carries money in his mouth. And you can guess what they try to do. Kill each other. <laughs> Cut the money. Oh. And to make it more fun, the car goes up the wall too and drives in S curves between them. Wow. <laughs> it's absolutely insane. So I just made a lot of photographs, but the one I wanted to make was the one that just told the story of the point of view and uh, used a very, very wide angle lens. I'm a real wide angle lens addict. Um, I love to get low and point it upwards and make the world come to a point and just uh, get that dramatic perspective. So there were so many people standing there that I couldn't really get to the front because I'd lost my position when I moved around. But I just held the camera over my head with the LCD screen pointing down so I could somewhat frame it and just kept shooting. Nice. No idea what I was going to get. Have you ever been to Japan? I haven't yet. Okay. How was your sure. experience there, John? I, I loved it. Um, I've only had about a week there. Uh, but uh, we really want to go back to Kyoto. Kyoto specifically? For me, um, you'll have to talk, come over someday and talk to Kim. She's been about four times wow. to different areas. And these were self-motivated trips or were these workshops? Or 
Yeah, they're self-motivated. Um, Kim does hiking and trekking, mm-hmm. and she does her 18-day thing, and I go and meet her at the end of it. Maybe maybe 10 days or something. I'm exaggerating, but yeah, she walks for 10 days, and I fly in on the last day. <laughs> Well, it's nice to have your personal time away too, but it's nice to gather your time there together. Yeah, yeah. Um, you had you mentioned know, morning walks, and that's what we do now. She has me out walking four miles in the morning. Nice. So maybe I'll go on one of the longer trips someday. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, my partner's equally as intrepid. She's out before I can even wake up, and she's already covered miles, and you know, <laughs> she's motivating me quite a bit. Um, yeah, so everywhere, everywhere I went in India, there's that incredible texture and people. And, um, you know, it took me a while to get used to pointing a camera at people. Unlike John, who's a professional portrait photographer and has a complete ease working with people in front of a camera, I always feel like the invasive tourist taking advantage of a moment. And well, so I'm I, actually the same way. I'm fine in the you? studio when someone comes to me. Street photography is tough for me. I, I can't do it except in Cuba. Yeah, places where we're not shunned. I mean, I certainly don't do much of it in Seattle. You know, people are really like, you'll hear from my lawyer, you know, the, the kind of attitude that uh, a lot of uh, highly developed or industrialized um, economy countries have this fear of being photographed. But uh, everywhere I go, I'm now loving photographing people. And partly it's the photographs and it's a chance to have an interaction with people. But for me, the, the camera is this beautiful key that unlocks a part of culture that I can't necessarily access myself. Um, what I've noticed on many of my workshops is that the female photographers seem to have a greater ease of approaching people. And it makes sense. They're not as perceived as maybe a threat or I don't know what that perception might feel like mm-hmm. to the individual. But when I see the pictures that result, um, when we do a little group crit afterwards or just a showing, um, always amazed at what, at what women can do, especially with children. You know, if I walk up to a child in a foreign country with a camera, it may be fine like this where the kids are unsupervised, but in countries where people are watching their kids, it's impossible. Even with permission, it breaks the entire spontaneity down. So I love to make photographs of people doing what they do. Um, and just trying to be lucky enough to get the moment where there's an interaction that either feels direct or indirect with me. Um, you know, in this case, these are kids that I, I hung out and talked with. They were really curious about what I was doing. So I just loved the way they were dressed and their, their faces. So, you know, this is what we do, a wrestler. people selling items. I went out there at night a lot with a small flash and a little soft box attached to it. A little Godox dedicated flash that I can use by radio onto mm-hmm. the camera. So really bright, strong, almost like Ouija. Remember the photographer Ouija who sure. did all the, the kind of blasting the crime light? Scenes. Yeah, the crime scenes. But the color was just phenomenal. And all the objects surrounding these people seem to bring to life a whole a whole strange surreality to itself. <laughs> um, well, I don't know how much, how much longer you want to go. We can keep going for a while. I don't know if people want to ask some questions. Uh, it could be about the trips. It could be about creativity. Sure, sure. I mean, let's open the floor to people. Yeah, let's do that. Um, I, I think that the only other thing I wanted to say, oops, I'm having a little trouble with my bandwidth here. Um, <laughs> For those who haven't done street photography or what I call just kind of personal documentaries where you walk through a place and you see what's next, it's a really interesting thing. I just want to say that regards to creativity, when I'm in a place like this and I'm not teaching or directly interacting with any students, I wander around and notice that I have a tiny, tiny bit of apprehension inside me. I don't know where I am. I don't know what I'm going to encounter. And that brings me to a heightened place of curiosity and also alertness. And it's in that little weird space that something germinates that I, that I call kind of the instant moment where I see something and I respond to it without thinking about it, without gauging it. And I'm able to do it in that space very easily compared to when I'm 
purposefully looking for something specific. Hmm. I don't know whether that made any sense to anybody, <laughs> but so coming across this doing. photograph of these gentlemen, as soon as I started to lift my camera to photograph them, this cow walked up. <laughs> and to me, that made the photograph because sure. I like to have more than one thing in the photograph whenever possible. And then the next photograph was where I walked down that, that alley and there's this beautiful little girl. So those are the gifts. And that's what I want to go back to Varanasi in India to photograph are these little gifts mm -hmm. that happen when you walk through the serpentine alleys. Same thing with Cuba. A couple of questions came in. Paul is think, asking about a ring light in the context of those photos you were showing at night. Have mm. you thought about a ring light or you have any feeling about it? It's, um, God, my bandwidth is killing me here. <laughs> Sorry. There you go. Yeah. Um, here they are. Just get to the photographs. We were visually talking about the same thing. Here they are. Um, it, it's, gosh. Hello, photo. It'll load. <laughs> yeah, it's a bandwidth thing. It's recording as well. OK. Um, what it is, it's, it's a little tiny soft box, if you will, that clamps onto the flash. The flash points up. You, you, um, you set it up like a little spring. It's one of those little, um, it's, a, it's a disc. Like a, like a light modifier disc, but it's two of mm -hmm. them webbed together by a piece of nylon. So it's, it's a back and it's a foreground. And the light goes up in between. This is all silver. And then the, the, the one in the front is kind of a translucent material. I don't have it here, unfortunately, yeah, to, that's, to grab. Yeah, I, but I was asking, a, a, a ring flash is different around the lens. Yeah. I, I don't think it works as nicely. I mean, here you got the shadows and yeah. it gives some depth and dimension to it. A ring light, I think, is too flat. Yeah, I'm, I'm holding it up here, kind yeah. of three quarter. Um, and luckily, I'm using a mirrorless camera that's very light, so I can really work the camera um, mm -hmm. while I'm holding this. I don't have anyone to do it with. The funny thing is that the first time I used it, I was in a crowd, and immediately there were 20 people who wanted to be photographed. Is this <laughs> so India? Careful what you wish for. I also found myself up on all these different um, social media sites because people wanted to be photographed with this guy, this this strange, not very <laughs> tall white guy. It was. It was, was this crazy. in India? Yeah. Yeah, I've heard that. If you when pull out a camera, all of a sudden you draw a big crowd. But everyone has a camera. But suddenly um, people were <laughs> people were grabbing me and taking selfies of themselves <laughs> with me. It was strange. Yeah, Eric is asking about Burning Man. He's never. Oh. He, said he has been to Burning Man several times, and the creativity helps with his photography. What's your experience? I know I haven't been to Burning Man since 2006, but you've been more recently. Yes, I went for three years from 2015, 2016, 2017. They're right here. And Burning Man is this incredible um, creativity event, I guess I would call it, uh, kind of a social culture and creativity event. And when you're there, you're, you're, you're a kid in a giant gift store at Christmas time. It, <laughs> it keeps delivering more and more incredible moments and visuals than you can possibly take in. Um, how many people here with a show of hands have been to Burning Man? Couple, okay. So you know what I mean? It's, an, it's a, it's a never-ending onslaught, a cornucopia of visuals and uh, opportunities, so. Well, I guess my question also is, since people are there creating their art and you're there photographing or documenting, where's the boundaries or how do you kind of take their creativity and make it your own creativity with your photography? Well, there actually are some uh, legalities around working with artists there. You, you have to get permission if you're going to put anything that you photograph at Burning Man on any online or, or paper source. It's not always done. But um, before anything's going to go on my website, I'm going to meet the people who made the art or at least contact them and get permission. And the reason is, is that Burning Man happens in a private space that's on public land. And so they consider that anything that happens once you enter Burning Man into that giant space uh, is private property. And you're photographing intellectual property, if you will. But the experience is incredible it's not the easiest place to be it's very destructive <laughs> on cameras as everybody who's been there knows destructive on cameras on relationships on people in general 
I mean, it's a crazy place. It is. Yeah. Um, it's, but it's, it's endlessly stimulating and mm -hmm. seeing things that are of this scale. Um, you see the bicycle in the background. It yeah. gives you a, uh, here's a bicycle. You can get a sense of the scale of things that are made there because they're on an open desert called the playa. They can be made at any size. And the largest things I've ever seen there were 58 feet tall. Um, I don't know when John and Eric went there, but uh, that was I the was tallest I was there from 1999 to 2006. Wow, those were golden years for Burning Man. There was only was... 25 to 30,000 people there at the time. Yeah, not not 80. <laughs> yeah, it was there 2003, five times, and last time I was there was 2013. Yeah, so you encounter all kinds of incredible things. I watched this guy running in the wind way out in outer playa, they call it. Those are the... <laughs> outer boundary areas of Burning Man. And he was just enjoying the high winds there in, in his uh, crow outfit. So I asked him if he would run back and forth and fly for me. And then and I then made a turned visual into a crow, it looks flying. like in the next photo. <laughs> Almost, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there were five giant 13 foot long, um, um, I think they were made out of resin and wood and metal, these giant crows, which were now bought, but they were bought by a city in the Southwest and used as a public sculpture. And I have a relationship with crows. And so for me, it was ideal. I have a picture of myself yelling at this crow. <laughs> and these other things, this was a, do you know what a camera obscura is? Sure. This is a camera obscura. Wow. See this eye here? Oh yeah. It's a, it's an aperture and Light goes through that aperture. That's basically the whole scene in front of it. It gets projected on the back of the inside of the head. You can enter one of the ears and go in and it's all painted white. And you see everything that's happening in the desert projected on that skull. Only instead of being upside down, it's been corrected by a prism behind the aperture. Absolutely insane. And the fingers articulate. Pretty amazing. Yeah, there it is. Wow. A couple of people on it. So you never know what you're going to find. These are robotic mushrooms that respond to your speaking and your closeness. They're all highly engineered. So you have people who are high end technical developers working with sculptural artists to develop completely new forms of expression. Um, when I first went to Burning Man and I was protected from the dust and the wind, you know, I had my goggles on and my mask, much the same way as we're using nowadays. Um, I instantly remembered it was the same as feeling of being in New Orleans after Katrina hit because I was in a hazmat suit the whole time I was there. Um, rubber gloves, rubber boots, duct taped everything because the air was extremely toxic in those homes and uh, buildings. So, yeah. Great. Does anyone else have questions or comments they want to add to our conversation? Michael has his hand up. Okay. So What's up? what do you do? How do you make money with these images? <laughs> Good question. Um, a number of these have been purchased privately. Um, certainly not the Burning Man ones for the most part, but a lot of the other portfolios have been purchased as portfolios or as individual images. Um, some of these, like this one, this one's blown up to 48 inches. Um, a lot of the photo illustrations were commissioned. Those are my commercial pieces. And um, after these are made, sometimes the uh, institutions that um, commission them purchase them as large prints. So it's either in the commissioned work or it's in the prints that follow but I don't have any current galleries that I work with. So how do you market this stuff? Like uh, Teresa's asking there, how do you connect with your private buyers? Um, how do people find you? They find me online through keywording, through um, other websites like Fine Art America and some of the ones that I used to be on. I'm not on any right now. I'm kind of remodeling the whole, the whole idea of how I want to sell these and how I want to be um, seen. But uh, since I started using the website, in 1999, um, people have been approaching me regularly for prints. 
I don't have to have a sales cart or anything like that. Um, I'm going to be developing a sales channel through my website where it's direct, um, but that's just how it's been working. I need to be more earnest if I want to reap the rewards of more income with it, but it's always just trickled in and at the rate that I can keep up with it. I have my prints made in Germany and they're shipped to America. It's a company that um, I really, really like working with called White Wall. <clears throat> Pardon me. There's White House Custom Color in Minneapolis, and this is called White Wall. They're actually headquartered in uh, Union Square in New York City, but their manufacturing's in Germany, and they make just amazing prints, and they're framed beautifully um, in non-traditional frames. Maybe you can throw their URL into the chat. Sure. I mean, they're, they're, yeah. they're expensive, so there's a lot, of, a lot of other ways of doing it, but uh, let me get the chat open. I wonder if I need to close this sharing in order to do that. Let's see well, if we I can put it in in a few minutes. Um, t let's see some. I just saw. An... Yeah, let me get the chat open. Have you tried their acrylic blocks? Acrylic what? Blocks, prints in acrylic. Um, well, I do print. Uh, my prints are laminated to the back of acrylic for those who want something like that as a material. But often they're laminated on top of aluminum. And so, John was asking, on your commissioned illustrations, do you retain the rights to the images or oh, do yeah. they go to the business that commissioned them? No, I don't work for, I don't do any work for hire. Um, I was, I had a really great relationship with the Baltimore Sun for about five years and until they merged and they produced a contract that was work for hire and I said goodbye. So yeah, I own the rights to everything. Um, when you shoot at Burning Man, you share the yeah, rights that's with a the difference. artist. Yeah. It's yeah. a different situation. Yeah, um, and I read all the contracts, and it was laborious, but I used to find holes in contracts regularly and point them out and say, you know, this contract's actually not saying what you mean it to say. <laughs> um, happened a lot. Hello, Stephen Shore. <laughs> um, you, you do realize there are sorry. two Stephen Shores. I know. <laughs> There's actually more than that. <laughs> oh, yes. There's many David Julians, and several of them are photographers. It's been kind of fun. I have two of them as friends on Facebook, actually. Well, I, I, I met the other Stephen Shore oh, about 40 years ago at a, at a meeting and introduced myself. He was not at all impressed that we had the same name. <laughs> <laughs> That's his problem. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, as far as monetary gain from the photographs, um, I'm probably a little bit more casual about the marketing of them than I should be. Um, I have a lot of them in stock files. Uh, Corbus has some of them. I, I have a, I have two pen names. Um, does anyone know who Milton Glazer is? Sure. Definitely. Um, my, my nom de plume is melting glacier. No way. <laughs> melting glacier. No way. <laughs> melting glacier. Yeah. And, uh, the other one, uh, there's a photographer who was, who, who is a really, really accomplished commercial photographer who was a who was a student of Jay Mizell, name is Pete Turner. And when I was at, at Pratt, he was one Wait of a them. minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. Well, I might have that reversed, but I- if Yeah, I, remember, I think you do. Yeah, I'm sorry. There's a Pete Turner book back there. I realized as, as I was saying that, that I had reversed it. Um, <laughs> but Pete, Pete was one of, my, one of my photographic heroes. And so when I was working in an industry that I didn't really want to use my real name in at the time, I was being asked to make photographs. Um, I use the uh, nom de plume, uh, Pete Turnip. <laughs> so weird things happen. <laughs> um, but yeah, I have some things in a couple of different <laughs> stock sources. We, we still need to get Jay Maisel on here because his name comes up in almost every conversation. Absolutely. Everyone needs to watch this one movie. John, oh, tell him what it is. Yeah. Uh, let's yeah, see. Jay Maisel is my favorite movie. I've watched it 10 times now. <laughs> it is an amazing movie and it's not about photography it's about an unusual and amazing personality who's a fantastic photographer and obviously a well known in the world yeah and work. i suggest getting the dvd because it has a lot of outtakes and extra material on it uh stephen wilkes put that stephen together wilkes, right. what's yeah. the name of the movie jay, jay myself. myself there it is right there in the chat i don't think you can see what i'm pointing at so just look at the chat yeah yeah Oscilloscope Productions, I think, is the company that produced it. Mm -hmm. I Wilkes. just added to the chat the name of that mm -hmm. company I've been printing with in Germany, Whitewall. Great. Yeah, go on their website and see their offerings. 
you'll see things that you, you can get domestically. But once I saw the quality of their printing and their offerings, uh, I, I ordered some tests with them. I was pretty convinced it would be worth it. By the way, White Wall uh, probably makes a, a good 70% or more of all of the photographic prints uh, for museums and, uh, um, and whatnot around the world. Mm -hmm. They're incredible. Absolutely incredible. They are. I learned of them through Chris Jordan, uh, who's a dear friend and, and collaborator on occasions, and uh, he used White Wall. And if it's good enough for Chris, it's good enough for me. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Chris is the person who invited me to come down to New Orleans too, right after Katrina, because he was making his second trip working on a book. And he said, Dave, you've got to come down here and work with me on this. And I, I was in Oaxaca at the time. So as soon as I got back home, I immediately flew down to New Orleans. He said, bring a hard hat, bring boots, bring several sets of heavy rubber gloves, bring a mask, bring Tyvek, whatever you can find. You're going to need it all. Bring lots and lots of duct tape. And he said, do not bring an electronically based camera. It will fail. And there's nowhere to get anything here. And he was right. Yeah. Amazing. Does anyone else have any questions? Because yeah. I haven't been minding the chat. I've been reading out the questions from the chat. So I think we've got most of that covered. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Uh, it's good to see you all. Those I, I actually had a question that uh, is probably better off at the end because it's a little bit less photography and a little bit more uh, personality stuff. It goes back to something that you said and Michael Newler's response to that, uh, and that was phrases that you've used that not everybody might understand or understand the way that you use them. Uh, and specifically, I'm talking about ADD. And I was wondering whether you were using that kind of in the colloquial sense, like, oh, yeah, I tend to be scattered, or whether or not this is really a, a, a factor in your life and your photography. And, and let me give you a little bit of background of why I'm even interested. Um, this year, three different people independently, without me even bringing it up, asked me the question, have you ever been diagnosed with ADHD as an adult? <laughs> and I asked the, and I said, what would even make you say that? Two of them were people who they themselves had recently been diagnosed uh, with ADD or ADHD as adults. And one of them had a kid who was recently diagnosed with that. And apparently some of us have personality characteristics that we don't recognize as such, but other people can instantly point at us and say, oh yeah, you're, you're, you're ADD. And I see that in the way you behave, the way you communicate, mm -hmm. the way you work. And, and so that fascinated me when, when you brought that up. So I was curious to hear how, how that factors in with, um, you know, your life, your work, the way, your thought processes. All right. I'm totally digesting what you're saying, and I can relate <laughs> to it, too. Um, when I was very young, I got notes, notes sent home by my teachers to my parents from school saying, your kid is daydreaming all the time, and he's not linear. <laughs> no one took me aside and said, let's go find out why. Um, but my whole, I think my whole brain pattern is, oh, there's a shiny object, oh, there's something, this interests me, and oh, there's that. And so later on in life, when I learned about attention deficit disorder and attention hyperactive deficit disorder, I realized that there's a very good chance that there's part of my chemistry that equals that. And then later on reading Daniel Amen's book um, about ADHD and ADD, I realized there are seven types of, of that. And a lot of creative people are one of them. It's part of our our ability to resource ideas, at least for me, um, if it wasn't for something that I considered to be a real, a real deficit for a long time, I realized that if it wasn't for that brain pattern of jumping from one thing to another, I wouldn't be able to randomly access things and pull them together the way I do for my work. So yeah, I, I think that's a common yeah. thing. Um, you know, for me, it's lyrics and things like that. Like if you gave me that test, give me four words and ask me those four words 10 minutes from now, 
I have no idea what those four chords are. But ask me the lyrics to a song I haven't heard in 40 years, and I'll recite them right out. And as I'm walking around or driving, I'll just point out signs. I'll read signs. My wife's always, where did that come from? Oh, that was that sign over there. Or where does that come from? You know, she just can't keep up with me. It's like, where, where does your brain go? Well, I think most of us, most of us that can do multitasking mm -hmm. um, are uh, ADT. Uh, I, um, <clears throat> I, I used to be able to do a lot of multitasking. And unfortunately, I haven't uh, been able to do that, not 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 uh, 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 medically or or, but physically have not been able to do multitasking a lot because of my my um, my situation because uh, I'm old. Um, uh, well, um, <laughs> many of us share that. <laughs> well, I'm going to be 76, but anyway. Um, and, and because I just won't I, admit it, uh, <laughs> even though you look it, uh, but anyway, <laughs> no, all right. you look good. Um, uh, um, and I'm not gay, but anyway, um, I, 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 I miss not having to do a lot of multitasking, but in the rest of my life, in my photography, in my library, I, I multitask all the time, day and night almost 24, uh, 24, seven, 365. And it drives my, my wife nuts. Cause I could be up at like three, four, five o'clock in the morning doing stuff that I, 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 I didn't get a chance to do while I was folding my, my laundry and taking out the garbage for her. I think there's a big difference between multitasking and classic ADD. Um, one is a less controlled random experience. Um, and, and, and is triggered by brain waves that are very different from those of the organized act of multitasking where you're purposefully have several things in play. But I think that where they intersect for me, and I don't know if there's any medical explanation that's better than this, I'm sure there is. For me, there's an intersection of multitasking and ADD, or at least what I perceive to be ADD, that's a very creative space that everyone experiences to some degree but that some people can't get to when they want to. It feels more random to them. Now, if I, if I get up and have coffee, I go into a much less controlled space of attention deficit or, or less creative random access. So I have to do basic tasks at that point of the day, which I definitely do. And then I get into a more relaxed state where I can access in a more um, purposeful and intentional way. But don't forget, there are different well, stages of ADP. Well, of course. But, but the, 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 back when I first moved to Seattle and I actually went and saw someone to get some, get some learning done on this, he said, you're not ADD. You're just extremely creative and you can't stay still. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know about that, but I'll take your word for it. But uh, since then, after lots of reading, I think it's pretty classic. And, and I think that a lot of people are misinformed about what it is. Well, I was thinking about it in the context of how you were describing the photo illustration project uh, process and how things start with a concept and continue to evolve and, and metamorphosize. You know, it's like, oh, okay, well, here's a ball with reflections and I think this needs a butterfly over here and I think this needs a skull over there. It's like, th that's kind of how my mind works and my friends yeah. look at me like, what the hell is wrong with you? Have you seen somebody, you know, uh, isn't there a pill that you can take to fix this? Uh, and, and the, but the other side of it, for, as, as a photographer, it's like when, when I don't necessarily know what I'm going to do, my natural inclination is to put on this humongous low pro backpack with, you know, uh, a half a dozen lenses and two camera bodies because I have no idea what might strike my fancy. And <laughs> an exercise that a number of photographer friends have come up with that they do, that they suggested that, that I perhaps do, and I need to practice with this, is take one camera 
and one lens and walk around with it all day and try to resist days. the urge to scream, you know, and, and, and like I've done that, like where I've gone on hikes with just a camera with a macro lens and I might see these huge, beautiful, you know, mountain vistas where I'd be, you know, screaming for my 16 uh, to 35 zoom, but it's like, no, let me ignore that and instead focus on this mushroom in front of this vast landscape because sure, I do that with one lens, I'm... but it's but it's usually an 18 to 400. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's too need to do with a prime lens. <laughs> um, yeah, bring a prime. I, yeah. I, uh, I, I bought a, enough primes that I'm covering the focal lengths I most want to use now. Mm -hmm. um, tiny little compact Fujifilm primes that I love. They're weather resistant. And um, I keep two bodies. I keep one with a zoom that I use for general work. And I keep this 23 millimeter on the camera that's facing me right now, actually. And that's it. Um, it. It takes away the variables that can lead to the what if, what if, what if, what if, you know. Um, it's a it's a way to stay focused when your natural tendency is to have no ability whatsoever to stay focused. <laughs> I think that there's a very. I, I think that there's some negativity put into the concept of ADD, but I think that really what you're describing to me is a more creative access of the brain and not so much of an attention deficit because for me, attention deficit means I go into a room to do something and I walk out doing something completely different, grabbing completely different, open up a drawer to find something. Next thing I know is I'm cleaning the drawer. I'm organizing the things in it. That's ADD. All day, every day for 61 years, that has been my life. And the most recent thing is rather than beat myself up for being that way and failing to do things that I focus on is, is getting to the point of accepting that that's who I am. I'm never going to be able to change that. And to see that, that, that there are things that I can do that other people can't do. Like they're focused on one thing and they have tunnel vision and I'm accessing all these other things, you know, and, and putting it all together uh, in ways, uh, stringing things together in ways that other people don't. Yeah, so a right. lot of it is your attitude about, is this a good thing or a bad thing, as opposed to how am I different than other people and how does that affect the way I live my life or the way that I do creative stuff, whether it's photography or music or, you know, relating to other people. Yeah, are, you happy, a... are, are you happy being the way you are? Um, it was difficult in the work world when I was with people who were very, very into, you've got to focus on this one thing and stay on it until it's done because no, then, no. yeah. No, the question but, is, but, are you happy being the way you I are? Am, I, I am now because I've accepted that there's no point in fighting things that you can't change and instead taking the perspective, how can I use this to my benefit? That's called maturity. Yeah, be yourself and accept yourself. That's Learn called, to like yourself. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's maturity and evolution. That's that, that has started this year. <laughs> you know, the whole, the whole rest of my life before that is, why can't I be the way everybody else wants me to be? Oh, my gosh. What a waste of time. Um, <laughs> That's right. You know, I've, I've, <laughs> I am not a regular meditator, but when I do incorporate it into my life, it's vastly changing. It, it, it slows down the mind. I, my, my mind is a beehive. There's no doubt about it. Um, and um, I used to feel like, how, I can't meditate. I'm bouncing off the walls here. All my ideas are all flooding because I'm actually sitting still. What a concept. I'm very active. Um, but what I learned is that you don't try to have no thoughts. You just notice your thought, and then you give yourself permission to come back to the center, and then you notice your other thought. You just keep doing that. And that's kind of the way I am with a camera now because – Visually, we are attracted by our peripheral vision, if we have it, or whatever it is that we're seeing outside the camera. And I think that the whole workflow for me is when I'm out shooting, I have to relax to a calmer state than when I first get off the bus or get out of the car or whatever, and take in the place on a number of sensory levels to the point where my body's relaxing, I feel safe, you know, whatever I am. And then the creative stuff can happen. 
And, and until then, there's a there's a tension and apprehension. If I'm in a foreign country, that's really heavy. Or if I'm in a big city and I haven't been in one in a while, there's a little apprehension, anxiety. Um, I organize my sensory experience to a point of a comfort zone that then seems to always result in a hyper awareness of what's around me, color, shape, people. And that's when the creativity starts with the camera. So having a purpose and intention before shooting may lead me to that place sooner, but it doesn't necessarily mean I'll do what I intend to do. Um, because how many times have I been on the streets of Havana and I'm walking like a hunter with a camera and then I get into a short conversation with somebody who I happen to point the camera at and next thing I know is an hour has gone by and we're walking together in a new place. And <laughs> is that random? Is that ADD? What is that? It's, it's the experience of it's life being alive in the moment. Right. Yeah. And um, um, it's, it's one of my favorite, favorite, places to be uh Tell me and, something. yeah what, what, what do you do when all the metadata that you've stored in your in your cerebellum and the uh -oh. synapses are are not as uh, uh quick as they used to be what do you do to um upload some of that metadata so that you'll have a lot more storage in your brain, in, in your in your human computer. See this? You shove it. Uh, Pull oh. it back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's it. Have you seen the Harry Potter movies, like where where Professor Dumbledore puts his wand next to his head and sucks the thoughts out, and then puts them in the little, you know, it looks like a bird bath, the pensive, and that's where he <laughs> stores his memories. It's like I need to get this stuff out of my head and store them, and then he has this cabinet with like ten thousand little vials of his thoughts. You know, well, I think getting, I think yeah. I haven't getting this out of I our heads. The, yeah, I think the secret about it is, is that you just have to be more relaxed about it. One of the things I found is, yes, I can't remember as quickly the things that I once could, but they all come back pretty quickly. <laughs> I, if I'm willing to wait four or five minutes, it'll come to me. <laughs> yeah, but it won't come yeah. to me in two or three seconds anymore. Yeah, yeah, but wait, wait, wait a while, and it'll come back to you like two, three, four, six months. Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's fine it with me. A problem. <laughs> But that speaking of time, we've been going almost two hours here. So, wow. uh, yeah, I think we're going to wait. Who's counting? It down. Nobody's counting. I know. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I can identify with everything you're saying. I, I do find some of the, some of my life is random access memory and some of it is hard drive. And we all know that the things that happened earlier in our lives are easier to recall in extreme precision than some of the things we did the day before. And I think that has to do with when it hit our brain and also the importance it had at the time, because we hadn't filled up our brains with so many pieces of metadata yet. And um, my theory is that all that good stuff result, exists on the inside of that hard drive in the very first grooves that were laid on the record. I can remember the phone numbers of all of my childhood friends. I can too, her family. That's yeah. crazy. No big deal. There were only two. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's um, it's actually part of my uh, my password. Yeah. Yeah. Two four one two one one nine four eight six six three two zero. So, so two when I go and you want to get into my hard drives, just find out who I knew. Three five one zero eight four three. Those are all the phone it's, numbers. It's yeah. crazy. You, know, you make a very interesting point uh, about that, uh, uh, David, because. Um, because when I was a kid, seven, eight, nine years old, um, there were telephones, but you picked up the phone and a live operator would come on and you would give her the phone number that you wanted. And she was, most of the time would say that line is being used right now because it was at the, they were, uh, what do they call them? Um, party lines. Party lines. Party the lines. Party line. Wait, patch, party line. patch base. Wait, wait, the cable you, is already in the hole. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and, wait, and wait I, a minute. I, you, you and I are not that different in age, and I never remember that. You, you didn't remember have party that? lines. Yeah, but wait, but wait, but where did, 
Where where did you grow up? Where did you live? Pittsburgh. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that, I think I'm, that I'm a city kid. Uh, yeah, growing but, up in New York City or Pittsburgh, kind of thing. Yeah, but I I, I mean I I would I would I grew up in New Jersey. You know, I, 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 there were operators. There were party lines. I remember the I remember the uh, the it was Livingston Six, <laughs> one six seven. That was, and then it became Wyman Two when they made it electronic. But Livingston Six number was a uh, was an operator that was putting yeah. wires and holes. I, I do remember that the the first summer I worked at the Pittsburgh Press as a photographer, the the switchboard operator still had one of those plug sets that they were using. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. I would love to own one of those things right now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find one for you. No. It's anyway, I'm going to stop the Facebook share now and start winding this down. So thank you to the folks who've been watching on Facebook. We'll see you next time. And for us here on Thursday, my guest is going to be Larry Lobdell. And then next week is Steve Brazel, a great um, concert photographer. And then for Technique on uh, retouching. So I hope to see you along on some of those. Wow. But I want to thank David so much for this two hours. Wow, this has been great. I could thank both of you all day long. Great. Yeah, sure. thank you, John, and thanks for everybody who who came to visit and also um, joined us on Facebook. I didn't know you do that channel. That's fantastic. Yeah. So I'm going to stop the recording now. We can stay on for a few minutes. I'll do the same. No, I won't. I'm going to keep it going until <laughs> you keep, until you all keep leave. Keep going. So David's still recording. I am not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I'm teaching online suddenly when I got back from Costa Rica last March and I, I work at, I teach for the University of Washington and teach in their photography program. And I have for, oh gosh, seven years now, maybe. Um, suddenly they said, everything's going online. Can you bring your course online? It was a real challenge to do it. Um, but what was neat was that since most of my courses were taught in our lab and I was behind the students, now all of a sudden I was facing everybody and there was a little bit more interactivity, not less. So I've been, I've been enjoying that experience of seeing everybody face to face and uh, having some interaction. So cool. it's, I, I, the other thing is that we're able to reach out to people across the world and across the country now in real time and, and speak to them. So there's been some little silver linings in this dark cloud of, of the pandemic. Um, when I teach and I bring in photographers occasionally on my courses, um, I'm working with people all over the world, you know, who just are willing to stay up or get up early enough to be with us in, on Pacific time. I think that what I'm getting at is that um, people tell me that they're bored, they're depressed, they're at home. And what I want to just end with is, is to say, get out, use your camera or even your cell phone and keep active creatively, keep responding to your environment and keep in touch with people. And if you can create your own cranial crowbar, that group that I mentioned before, it is the most amazing thing. And a lot of my ex students are now in small groups they've created around that theme. Just talk about creativity the way we're doing now. Talk about um, self assignments or give one out to everybody. Uh, keep in the game, keep in the conversation and uh, keep, keep doing stuff. What are you going to, what do you tell people, for example, that live in California that just got an order uh, to um, uh, stay at home? Well, I haven't had the experience of talking to them directly, but um, lots of my students experienced this sudden lockup where they were used to shooting outdoors. They were used to going anywhere they wanted to shoot. And suddenly they were at home in lockdown earlier in this year. Um, and I said, you've got to be like the Cubans. You've got to make something out of what you have and not complain about what you don't have. And that includes access to the environments you're most comfortable in. We are creative people. We're inventors, we're problem solvers, and we're survivors by nature. And we need to go back to those instincts to keep busy, keep active, keep creative. And it may sound easy for me to say that to you, but we all have the ability to get out of our heads, get off the news <laughs> and, and, and think about what's most meaningful to you. I think that I meant to say this hours ago. What is the most meaningful, what is the most meaningful thing to you on a couple of levels, visually, attractively, um, in your heart? Like, what do you respond to? Who do you respond to? Think about the things that are the most positive influences and, and, um, 
inspirations in your life and use those as uh, as the keys through the doors uh, that you feel um, shut in by. Um, hey, David, I, I was curious. I'm looking on your website and I'm looking at your workshops. Do you offer individual mentoring? Yes. Yeah. I, gosh, I hope it's there. Um, I could just, I'm on my phone, so I could just not be. I'm going to just hit share screen for a moment, if I may. Is, is that okay, John, if we do? Yeah. Yeah. Keep going. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to get to Safari here. And I wanted to say, Michael, um, with your question about, you know, working while you're in lockdown or quarantine, um, I, I create in my home, um, so I, I'm well practiced in doing that. Um, but if you look on my website, um, you can see what I did during lockdown. And if anyone here has questions about how to work while you're trapped in your house, I'm happy to. Did you put your website in the chat? I think I did. I think it's back at the top. Okay, well, we might do it again just in case yeah. if people came in later, they won't see it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, please, please contribute. Um, I, uh, John, is there a way to access the chat after the... Um... Yeah, I'll, I'll send you a... Uh, actually, you're recording, so I think you'll get a copy of the chat. Ah, okay, great. Thank you. But if I'm not, sure let my, me know. I'm sure my hard drive's melting right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you, if you go back to my website, um, just for those who are curious... Um, Oh, I can't even get there. If I go to davidjulian.com and then um, yeah, let me just do it really quickly. All right, so here's the website. You go to here or here, creative learning. It goes to my blog, which is desperate for a, re, a remodel. Um, and this is where I put things coming up. I actually have a few things to add uh, later this week. And it also talks about working individuals. I work, whoop, that should say with, um, work with individuals, custom individuals, individual instruction or mentoring, whatever you want to call it. And I have probably, let's see, I, I have seven right now. Um, so that goes from being a couple of people sometimes to as many as 10 or 12. And um, yeah, it's a really great experience made easier by this medium. Uh, where are you located, Teresa? Um, I'm actually in Seattle too. Oh, um, awesome! I, I'm a little embarrassed by this. I've I've just been introduced to your work today, um, <laughs> and I'm I'm in love. I mean, I'm just blown away. And there's so many parallels to my own working style mm. that I'm just kind of like my mind's sort of exploding right now. <laughs> That's so cool. Great. Thank you. Great. Um, so I'm super happy to be introduced to you and your work, and this is just amazing. So. Well, thank you so much. I can't wait to see yours as well. <clears throat> I tend to look back on these and look up people and then do the rabbit hole that we're all known for. That's the real <laughs> ADD, that rabbit hole, right? Eat yeah. the mushroom, yep. dive down the hole and see what happens. <laughs> but um, yeah, so most of these now say inquire because we're, we're, we're waiting to see when we can get back and do these things. But uh, yeah, please, if anyone wants to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, um, it's always possible. On, on different formats, whether we meet like this or we meet like this, and sometimes we do socially distant shoots together um, in favorite places in the area. So, well, I may have to ask you for the rest of this recording and to splice it onto the original recording. We can do that. Send me the stuff after I stopped. I, was, I, I love good stuff going. I love any chance to do this, um, not because I want to see myself, God forbid, on, on any recorded medium, but because I love to meet people like yourselves and uh, reconnect with people I haven't seen in a while. And it just is like, that makes the whole week awesome to me. Good. Glad we gave you a good Monday. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, John. It is Monday, John. right? Uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> and, and John, I just, you know, hats off to you uh, for creating this out of this pandemic and you did it like instantly. <laughs> Did you planned on doing something like this before? Not at all. Now? Not at all. Um, I, I started actually was just going to teach some lighting classes online. And then I said, well, first, let me invite someone else to be a guest. And I said, oh, this guest thing work. Maybe we'll just talk and show some pictures. And mm -hmm. I think we're up to 70 now. That's amazing. Oh, I want to I want to just do you know a Barian X Perillo? Yes. Have you ever listened to his podcast? Occasionally, I haven't in a while. I just emailed him recently to ask how how to help promote these podcasts. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's called the Candid Frame, and it's another really wonderful experience to keep in touch with um, 
and uh, hit the streets as Valerie Jardins were friends and she came to Cuba with me. Um, yeah, there's just, there's just so many amazing things out there. And, um, you know, if you want to see, these are all kind of aging now, but there's some podcasts I've been involved with. These are some articles that I've written over the years. You can see they go back to 2002 and you can get more inside my head than I could do today. But thanks <laughs> for giving me the opportunity and the time and the space to do this, John. It's sure. It's awesome. And I've always wanted to collaborate with you on something. So here we are. Good. Let's do a trip to Cuba when we can. <laughs> ah, yes. Oh. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you all. This has been really wonderful. Uh, as I said, we'll be back on Thursday and then next Monday and Thursday. And I don't know, it may take Christmas Eve off, and New Year's Eve off. We'll see. Good idea. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, but, I've, but I've got stuff scheduled now into to January. I've got Roman Laurence coming on to talk about large format photography with film and darkroom printing and things like that. Uh, so looking why, forward why, to that. And Why are you going to take New Year's Eve off? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I had someone scheduled for, for Christmas Eve, but we just pushed it out to January because family can stuff for him. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I'll be here. I'll be no, here. No place to go. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great thank day. You. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you again. Thank you, thank thank you very everybody. much. Take care, David. Thank you all. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you. And Sarit, are you, you calling did. in nice from to see Israel? You too. Oh, she was gone.